Hey team, Jack here, and today I'm going to take you through just quickly how does your body first detect and respond to SARS-CoV-2, aka COVID-19. So let's just jump into it. The first thing I want to do is have a look a wee bit at the human anatomy. So this is a lung alveoli. So this is where gas exchange occurs inside your lungs. In here is gaseous, out here is the bloodstream. And so this is where gas exchange is going to occur. And we see these cells inside and outside the alveoli. And these cells are macrophages, right? So we have alveoli macrophages that are in the alveoli and interstitial macrophages that are between the alveoli and the blood vessel. We also have monocytes which come down the blood vessel and can be recruited in to uh, the interstitial space and replace these macrophages here. So the monocytes can then become macrophages. And so really, it's these monocytes and macrophages that are your first um, responders when it comes to SARS-CoV-2. And so what does that mean? That means when we start talking about how does your immune system initially respond to SARS-CoV-2, we're talking about the innate immune system. The adaptive immune system is going to come later. So the innate immune system, the response can be broken up into sensing, signaling, response, and resolution, SSRR. Sensing, signaling, response, and resolution. So let's start with sensing. How does a macrophage detect a pathogen or another resident uh, immune cell? How do they detect a pathogen? And what they do is they detect pathogen-associated molecular patterns, which are molecules on the surface or released by uh, pathogens. Now, there are a lot of pathogens out there, right? There are a huge number of pathogens out there, and each of them are going to be covered in a unique set of pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Not only that, when your body evolves to detect and respond to a protein or a carbohydrate or a molecule on the surface of a pathogen, there is now a selection pressure for that pathogen to change its PAMPs, evolve away from its existing pathogen associated molecular patterns into a new one right so there's this arms race can we develop detectors for those pathogens and can they change those pathogens um, pathogen associated molecular patterns fast enough for us not to detect them and it's for this reason that the macrophage and other innate immune cells have developed a huge number of receptors designed to bind to and detect these PAMPs. So let's just have a look at a few of them. And this isn't all of them, this is just a few of them. Oh, just quickly, so yeah, there's different molecular patterns. And what I'm gonna do is, here's a, just some examples, right? So on gram-negative bacteria here, we have lipopolysaccharide, and they act as a PAMP. On yeast and fungus, we have a glucan coating, for example, that our body can detect and respond to. Um, and in, RNA, in, in viruses such as coronavirus, there might be weird RNA that might be GU rich or GC rich. And if we look at we segment of the coronavirus here, we can see GU, GGU, GU. We can see high GU rich RNA here in the coronavirus. So these are molecular patterns that are unique to pathogens and aren't expressed on our tissues. And we've, because, as I mentioned, there's so many kinds of pathogens and they're always changing their PAMPs, we've developed a ridiculous number of receptors. So these receptors can be on the cell surface, like these toll receptors here, and there's a huge number of toll receptors, um, or toll-like receptors, I should say, TLRs, toll-like receptors here. There's also receptors inside the endosome or phagosome. So if a cell engulfs um, some extracellular fluid or particles, it now brings it in as a phagosome or an endosome. There might be receptors designed to look into the phagosome or endosome, but there's also cytosolic receptors designed to detect anything peculiar going on in the cytosol of the cell rather than just in the extracellular space. But there's also lectin receptors that mostly detect carbohydrates going on in the extracellular space, and there's a huge range of them. And then there are the inflammasome receptors, which these are my favorite. Um, and there's a huge number of them. This is the evolutionary tree of them. But there's, you know, dozens of these cytosolic receptors here that are like NOD receptors or IPAF receptors or NLRP receptors. Now, just to give you an idea on how niche research has become, because humans, you know, we know so much, you need to focus so intensely to advance just your tiny field a little bit further. So scientists 
get really focused. And just to demonstrate, out of all of this, my research expertise, something I would consider myself an expert in, is just this guy here. NLRP3. That's my guy. It's awesome. But just to give you an idea that I'm working, um, my research is a drop in the ocean of research around innate immune system. Needless to say, I think NLRP3 is hugely important. And I could go talk about it for days, but I won't. Anyway, so these are all just receptors designed to try and to detect different molecular patterns found on different pathogens. And these pathogens are always changing. So we need to always change and develop new receptors. Um, so let me just give you an example of a couple that will work um, for SARS-CoV-2. One is toll-like receptor 7, PLR7. Um, it's designed to detect um, uh, viral RNA, which tends to have unique sequences in viral RNA, um, GC-rich, for example, or GU-rich RNA. So uh, here we have the cell membrane, the extracellular fluid up the top with the viruses. The macrophage eats a bunch of viruses in the extracellular space. This creates the phagosome. So when the membrane bends around the virus, buds in, now we have a phagosome. Inside all cells, pretty much, there are lysosomes, and there's lots of lysosomes inside macrophages. These are a highly acidic organelle vesicle that are full of, it's really highly acidic, pH sort of 5, 4 region, um, and it's full of digestive enzymes. Honestly, saying that it's the stomach of the cell is a really good analogy, because our stomach is acidic, um, whereas the lysosome is also full of digestive enzymes, which the stomach doesn't have too many of. It does, but not too many. So uh, the lysosome then fuses with the phagosome, making the phagosome acidic and full of digestive enzymes. Um, and so we end up with the phagolysosome down there. And now the phagolysosome has formed the digestive enzymes and the acids will break down the viral particle and everything will come spilling out. This is why we have receptors in our phagolysosome, because we can crack open pathogens and be exposed to a whole bunch of new PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So TLR7 can then detect the viral RNA and initiate a cascade of secondary signaling molecules, phosphorylation, it's really standard secondary signaling pathways, whole bunch of molecules get phosphorylated and eventually you end up with the activation of a transcription factor called NF-kappa-B. Now NF-kappa-B is such an important transcription factor, I have to tell you its name. Typically I don't tell you the name of molecules that are, aren't that important because you can't learn all 30,000 proteins in the human body. Um, sorry, 30,000 genes, there might be 2 million proteins thanks to splicing and whatever. So uh, you can't learn 2 million proteins but NF-kappa-B is such an important one, I really want you to learn it, because it regulates a huge portion of the immune response. So NF-kappa-B, once activated, goes from the cytosol into the nucleus, it recruits RNA polymerase, and away we go. We start generating a whole bunch of inflammatory antipathogen genes get turned on, essentially a huge number of genes. I think NF-kappa-B regulates over 600 genes to do with the immune response. So TLR7 detects the RNA and turns NF-kappa-B on. Another one is RIG1. Now, this is an interesting one because this detects viral RNA in the cytosol rather than in the phagosome. But how do you get viral RNA in the cytosol? Well, you get it through infection. So uh, in this case, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 has bound to the ACE2 receptor on the macrophage. And that's super interesting because macrophages do express ACE2. Other viruses bind to other um, membrane proteins that aren't expressed on macrophages. So RIG1 would not work for them because there would never be viral RNA just released into the cytosol. Um, the original SARS, SARS-CoV-1, um, couldn't get into macrophages through this mechanism, through binding to a receptor, because the receptor wasn't expressed on a macrophage. And so RIG1 wasn't involved in that response. There are a couple of exceptions, but yeah, roughly, uh, this is a, a good example of how viral RNA gets into a macrophage. It requires the expression of that protein. 
So group one normally floats around in a monomer form and it forms a dimer as they both bind to the uh, viral RNA. And this again requires that unique nucleotide sequences that are often found in viruses and aren't found in our genome. When it dimerizes, it again causes a phosphorylation cascade that activates a number of uh, transcription factors. Um, and we've got NF kappa B and IRF. Um, which uh, will induce interferon responses, and NF kappa B will induce uh, cytokines, prostaglandins, and other genes in involved involved in the immune response. So here we're going to get um, an inflammatory response, and here we're going to get an interferon response. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that later. Right now, we're just dealing with sensing SARS-CoV-2. So Rig one is really important for sensing. SARS-CoV-2 and the viral RNA. So now let's move on to signaling. Now that we've detected SARS-CoV-2, what happens next? Well, um, so the resident immune cell will produce prostaglandins and cytokines. Let's do a quick breakdown of what they are. So prostaglandins are a small molecule. Um, they're more of a metabolite than um, something like a protein. Uh, they are produced by an enzymes, um, and one example is the COX-2 enzyme. And this enzyme it will digest uh, compounds from the phospholipid membrane and turn them into a prostaglandin, which can then go off and act as an inflammatory signaling molecule. Um, so the COX-2 uh, enzyme is normally not expressed and it's turned on in response to a damage-associated molecular pattern or a pathogen-associated molecular pattern, or it can even get turned on by other inflammatory signaling molecules acting on the receptors of the cell. So maybe um, an inflammatory signaling molecule from another cell will come bind to the receptor and kind of act like a PAMP or a DAMP, but it's actually produced internally from a uh, from you, you. Um, and it's, it's, it's slow because it requires that gene expression change, which does take a little bit of time, um, and, it, and it is capable of prolonged signaling. We can continually pump out these prostaglandins using our COX-2 enzymes. Now, you might all be familiar with prostaglandins and COX-2 because many pain relievers and anti-inflammatories that you guys take inhibit this enzyme. So, for example, um, aspirin, ibuprofen, Voltaren, they all inhibit the COX-2 enzyme, preventing the production of prostaglandin, protecting that, preventing that inflammatory immune response. So this is why they're anti-inflammatories. That's why aspirin is an anti-inflammatory. Um, and here, quick, here's some um, research hot off the press, tracking the expression, the amount of COX-2 enzyme um, in the lungs of, uh, this is actually a mouse model of SARS-CoV-2. So they've infected mice with um, a coronavirus and they're looking at COX-2 expression. And you can see after four days and seven days, the COX-2 expression goes up massively post-infection. And that's as the virus starts to replicate and take hold. We can now then detect it and now then initiate an inflammatory response. And now you will start to see symptoms of, of the, the coronavirus, because many of the symptoms are actually caused by our immune response. And this is why you might be contagious before you're symptomatic. Right, so prostaglandins. Now moving on to cytokines. Now cytokines are a little bit different. Cytokines are protein inflammatory signaling molecules, but they can also be anti-inflammatory signaling molecules. They are proteins that regulate the inflammatory response. Um, so they are again a little bit slow because they require changes in gene expression. Um, and there's a few different kinds of cytokines. And by a few, I mean a hectare. There are a hectare of cytokines. So I'm just going to go through a couple of examples. So what, here we've got interleukin-1, IL-1, and TNF, TNF-alpha. Now these both require gene expression and post-translational modification. And the reason is these are extremely inflammatory, and so the cell wants to be very sure before it releases them. So without this post-translational modification, these uh, inflammatory molecules won't be released pretty much, and they won't be very inflammatory. 
So it's acting as, a, a, it requires two stages. You need um, the switching on of the genes, and then you need some a second signal to initiate these post-translational modifications, which are cleavage in this case, the cutting of the protein, will activate it, and now it can be released in inflammatory. So it's got this two checkpoints, because we don't want to accidentally release these molecules because they're so inflammatory and inflammation can be damaging. Remember, the innate immune system is like a tank. It uses crude mechanisms that cause damage to the pathogens and damage to us. Um, but another example, say interleukins, um, interleukin-6, so that's IL-6 instead of IL-1 down here, and interferons. So these are protein inflammatory signaling molecules, cytokines, um, and these don't have those checkpoints. These just need to be expressed and then they're automatically released. Um, interestingly, so remember how I said inflammation, if it's too much, if it's too long, it can be damaging because it's a lot like a tank, it can cause collateral damage. Uh, there's actually been a clinical trial now on a drug, which is actually an antibody. We'll go into that later, but it's a drug that blocks the IL-6 signaling. And it found that it reduced the death of severe late case, late stage SARS-CoV-2. So if you're intubated in a hospital bed, your lungs are hugely inflamed, which means because of the leaky blood vessels, they're filling up with liquid, and this inflammation is producing bleach, which is killing your cells. And you know, so you're having this non-specific uh, damaging response, inflammatory response for a long period of time, and it's too much. Um, it can actually cause death. And so by blocking the inflammatory response here with this drug, which is an antibody, which I'm going to go into later, um, uh, this antibody blocks the IL-6 signaling, you can actually prevent some of the deaths caused by SARS-CoV-2. Right, let's keep going. Okay, now sometimes learning the etymology or the word origins of a, uh, of, of a scientific term really don't help. Like TLRs, learning what TLR means or what NLRP3 means or what nf -kappa b means, it doesn't help you understand the situation. So what we do is we just talk with acronyms and that's what everyone does. Everyone just says TLR and we know what TLR means. It's one of those receptors that detects PAMPs, right? Um, but sometimes the etymology game can help you learn. So uh, I'm going to jump through an etymology game, just three rounds here. So the first one, uh, leuco. Leuco is Greek for the word white. Site means cell, and you guys know that. Leukocyte, lymphocyte, you know, um, a lot of site, monocytes, a lot of sites mean cells. So leukocyte means white blood cells. So leukocytes, any white blood cell in your blood, that's a leukocyte, right? Etymology game round two. Inter means in, right? That's obvious. Inter means in. Luke is short for leukocyte. And in mean, is, uh, means uh, a compound. So penicillin, insulin, <laughs> in, the ending in means compound. So you end up with interleukin, which means something found in leukocytes. So in leukocytes compound, right? So interleukin just means a compound found in leukocytes. So it's not an, inf an informative definition, just learn interleukin, IL, it's a compound found in interleukin. Round three, interferon. It was named because it interferes with viral life cycles. So this is a nice and simple one. Interferons interfere with viral life cycles. So that's an etymology game. Um, and so now we're going to start looking at the response. But what I might do is stop there and we'll look at how the body responds once the signaling has occurred to SARS-CoV-2, just to keep the videos not too long.